So we're in the middle of a short series on Christians under pressure. And uh, the original, original sermon series was a three-lesson uh, sermon series by John Baker that he presented at Faith Builders. But um, I, I couldn't do what, I couldn't preach what he preached in one sermon. It takes me two. So uh, that's why it's going to be six for us. But we're at the end of Daniel chapter two. And when we complete this sermon, we'll finish Daniel chapter two. And then the next two lessons, the final two lessons will be from lessons from Daniel chapter three. And we live in a world that's changed. We talked about how two weeks ago, we talked about that in the 1950s to the 1990s, the environment in America was actually very positive toward Christianity and biblical ideas. In fact, they, most people expected that. And then we get from the 1960s to 2010, and there seems to be a neutral atmosphere that was created in our culture. And then somewhere around 2014 to 2024 in that period, our culture has now became literally hostile toward Christian ideas and biblical uh, views, especially when it comes to biblical morality. And so that's why we're studying Daniel. Uh, there's some principles that when Daniel and his friends were taken into Babylonian captivity and how they dealt with all the pressures of this new environment and the culture and the compromising that uh, was basically almost forced upon them, was forced upon them, how did they deal with all that? There's a lot of lessons in that that we can learn from. So principles from the book of Daniel can help us as Christians know how to uh, deal with and respond to the increasing pressures that are in our own culture. A few weeks ago, we also learned uh, in Daniel chapter 2, we're, we're going to subtitle it, Christians Look Up to God. We need to turn to God and remember um, many different principles. And the first one is false ideas are futile. We went over that two weeks ago. They might seem right. They might appear right. They might be widely accepted by the majority. Usually they are. But they will fail us in our greatest moment. If we believe and put our trust in false ideas, false concepts, false philosophies, they will fail us in our moment of greatest need. And we identified that moment of our greatest need is judgment day. On the day of judgment, we're going to want the grace that's provided by the blood of Jesus Christ. We need to make sure that the ideas that we believe in and are aligning our lives with are in accordance, in agreement with the truth of the word of God. We just sang the song, the wise man built his house upon the rock. And in Matthew chapter 7, 24 through 27, that's where we get the words from that song. And we need to make sure that we're building on the rock. We're building our lives upon the rock of Jesus Christ instead of the sand of the doctrines of men and the philosophies of men in the world. We also learned two weeks ago that Christians are to look up because sincere praise is vital. We started in Daniel chapter 2, verse 17 through 23, after King Nebuchadnezzar had he had this dream, and it disturbed him. And he went to his wise men, and he didn't just ask them to interpret his dream. He asked for a literal miracle. He wanted them to tell him what he dreamed, and then he would know that if they could tell him what he dreamed, then he would know that they would be telling him the truth about what the dream meant. And if they didn't do it or couldn't do it, he was going to kill them. And the word gets back to Daniel and his friends, and what do they do? They take it before God. And then God answers their prayer, their worship, their praise, and then they praise him and worship him some more. In Daniel chapter uh, 2, 17 through 23. And so we learn in this section that praise is vital 
When we praise God, it's the right response to God. It instructs those around us. We talked about that two weeks ago. And it strengthens our resolve to serve God. Especially when we put our heart into our worship. And then this brings us to today's lesson. As we continue in uh, studying chapter 2, what are some of the important principles that God's people need to hear when we're struggling with our faith when we're struggling, uh, being under pressure from the culture around us? Well, today we're going to pick up in Daniel chapter 2 when Daniel was brought right before King Nebuchadnezzar. And he's going to not only tell King Nebuchadnezzar what he dreamed, but the interpretation of the dream through the miraculous, uh, through a miracle that God has given him that information. And so we're going to talk about uh, human power is transitory. It's temporary. It's changing. The kings and the kingdoms of the earth, they come and they go. They may feel like they are going to last forever, but these kingdoms, they're not going to last forever. If we consider what the Bible says about history, maybe we shouldn't get so caught up in nationalism. I might have stepped on a few toes here. You know, there's nothing wrong with loving our country. I love my country. I, I served my country in the military. Many of you did too. But I think we should be more concerned about being a faithful citizen of God's kingdom, the church, than we are nationalists and patriots of the United States. God set up a kingdom, the church, and that is more important than any U.S. national patriotism. Human power is transitory. Now watch it. We're going to come back to the U.S. in a minute. Watch it now. Let's go to Daniel chapter 2. And we're going to read verses 31 through 34. If you haven't opened your Bibles to Daniel chapter 2, this would be a great time to do so. Daniel chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 31 through 34. You, O king, this is what Daniel told the king. We're watching and behold a great image. This, Im this great image was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and its arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, and its legs of iron, its feet partly, partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands which struck the image at its feet of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. This is the roadmap that we spoke about a couple weeks ago. There's four earthly kingdoms, four world empires shown here in this text. <clears throat> Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And they didn't know what the next one was going to be called right away, but uh, uh, they could wait till one empire ended and another one began, and they could follow this roadmap, this roadmap that God had given them. And don't think that just because one empire falls and another empire takes over that the things are going to get better. Not necessarily that that will take place. You know, it's interesting that God didn't tell this dream he didn't give this dream to the Israelite slaves down by the river. He didn't give this dream to even the prophet Daniel. He gave this dream to the pagan king, Nebuchadnezzar. I think it's obvious that God wanted Nebuchadnezzar to learn something. So Daniel miraculously tells the king what he dreamed and the interpretation of the dream. Notice the important phrases as we keep reading. Let's look at Daniel chapter 2, 37 through 38. You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. Notice that, that God has given you. Let's keep reading. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them. All you are the head of gold. So basically God said, Nebuchadnezzar, you're the most powerful man on the earth. Powerful, most powerful man on the planet. 
But God is, is the one that's given you this kingdom. He's the one that gave you the empire. And someday you're going to stand before Almighty God, a higher power than you. And you're going to be held accountable for how you conducted things in your kingdom, this empire that I gave you. And so in Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar finds out uh, God gave, gave him a kingdom and he can also take it away. He humbles Nebuchadnezzar in, in Daniel chapter 4. You remember how he basically was like a wild animal for a while. And then God restored his mind. Let's read on in Daniel chapter 2, 39 through the first part of verse 40. But after you, after King Nebuchadnezzar, but after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, and then another, a kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth, and, a four, and the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. So after you, there's going to be another one, and after it, there's going to be another one, and after that, there's going to be another one. Kingdoms come and kingdoms go. Do you see what God's trying to say? Human power is transitory. It's temporary. Kingdoms come. Say it with me. And kingdoms go. Do you ever think about what's going to happen when America is no longer a nation? If you look back at Bible history and you look at secular history, Kingdoms rise and they fall. And America is no exception. Now, we don't know what it's going to look like. Maybe Christ will come before that happens. But if the world stands and if it's God's will and history keeps going like it has in the past, America will cease to exist at least in the state that we currently know it. Either it could be totally taken away or changed or altered in some way. Kingdoms are uh, powers transitory. Kingdoms are transitory. Do you ever think about what's going to uh, happen in the future with the uh, governments in different countries and different nations? We read on what Paul says in Acts chapter 17 and verse 26. Notice what Paul says, talking about God. And he made from one blood, that's the new King James, other versions will say from one man. And that's the idea behind it. From one blood, every nation. Because Adam was the first man. And from him, the first man, all people and all nations have come. And he made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. And he has, who has? God has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. God's appointed when nations fall, rise and nations fall. God's appointed what the extent of the boundaries of their kingdom will be and what they won't be. God raises up nations and sets their boundaries. He is the one who decides when kingdoms begin and when they end. And if you read your Old Testament, you see that God can use even evil kingdoms to conquer and punish and discipline other nations, even destroy another nation. When God said after you, in verse 39, he was reminding Nebuchadnezzar, you're not going to reign forever, Nebuchadnezzar. Now let's look at verse 35, the first part. Then the iron and the clay, the bronze and the silver and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff. From the summer threshing floor, the wind whew, carried them away so that no trace of them was found. Talk about a humbling message. He just told Nebuchadnezzar that he's nothing more than chaff. Don't you know who you're talking to? I'm the ruler of this empire, the most important man on the planet. All these kingdom that we read about here will become like chaff. Even the Babylonian empire represented with the precious metal of gold will become like chaff. Nebuchadnezzar, you're going to become like chaff. Chaff is the stuff that you get when you take the pitchfork and the wheat and you thresh it and you uh, throw it up in the air and the chaff is blown away. 
It's like that whole stuff, thin layer of uh, whole stuff on the grains of wheat. <clears throat> it's useless. It goes away. And these kingdoms, God is saying, the kingdom of Babylon and Persia and Greece and Rome, they're going to go away. And then this, when it comes to spiritual things, they're useless. This is what happens to the ungodly. In Psalm 1 and verse 4, the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Here's the message of Daniel 2.35. These kingdoms, these governments seem to so strong and abuse God's people. They're like the chaff. We need to remember that. They're transitory. They're only temporary. And they'll go away. Don't be overwhelmed or super impressed by governments and kingdoms and their powers. That's what God wanted the Israelites to remember as each generation followed the map and waited for when the, the next kingdom would come and the next kingdom. And finally, in the fourth kingdom, the kingdom of God would come. They're waiting on that. God would establish his kingdom, his church. And that's what God wants us to remember when we live in a nation that is hostile toward true Christian ideas and biblical morality. In Daniel chapter 2 and verse 47, the king answered Daniel and said, Truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of, of kings, and a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. Did Nebuchadnezzar humble himself and start serving Almighty God? Text doesn't seem to indicate that. In this chapter, all that Nebuchadnezzar is willing to admit is that Daniel's God knows things. He knows stuff. He's, he knows what's going to happen in the future. And Nebuchadnezzar knows this is a fact because Daniel is the one who told Nebuchadnezzar what he actually dreamed. As we ponder the idea that human power is transitory, we need to make some application. Sometimes, and I'm no exception, I promise, sometimes we get these if only thoughts in our mind. What do I mean by these if only thoughts? We get them stuck in our heads and, and they become so limiting, so restrictive to our spiritual growth. Sometimes even Christians, we feel the pressure on our culture to conform to the world around us and we get these words if only stuck in our thinking. If only I had a different job. If only I lived someplace else. If only I had a different family. If only I made more money. If only my situation in life were different. If only certain laws were passed. Or if only my candidate was in office. Then, then, oh God, I, it would be easier to serve you. Then, oh God, I could be a better Christian. Mm, you see the problem with the only, if only statements? If only statements... are contrary to the doctrine taught by Christ for us to be content in whatsoever state we're in. One of the things that Daniel 2 is trying to teach us is to get the if-only thinking mindset out of our minds and, and just serve God. Serve God where we are with whatever resources He's given us they might be few, they might be many. And in whatever time period God has placed us to live, just serve God, just trust and obey God. We sing trust and obey, don't we? Don't worry about the if-then statements. You know, Daniel and his friends were, in, were slaves in a foreign country. You think they had some if-then th statements pop in their mind every now and then? If-only statements, I should say? Of course they did. But they trusted and obeyed God. They just, God just wants us to be faithful. Christians, don't be overwhelmed by the power that we see in the kingdoms of men. 
What did Jesus say to Pilate in John 19 and verse 11? You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Nebuchadnezzar, your kingdom isn't going to last forever. And neither will Persia, and neither will Greece, and neither will Rome. And if the Lord doesn't come, neither will the United States. The final idea that I'd want to share with you today, for when we're under pressure, for when you and I are looking at all the philosophical and moral changes that are rapidly taking place in our society, I want us to remember this most of all. God's kingdom is forever. We need to look up. We're going to look at Daniel chapter 2, verses 44 through 49, before we conclude the lesson. God's kingdom is forever. After Daniel lists the four world empires, he gets to the fourth kingdom, the Roman Empire, and he says the words of Daniel 2, 44 and 45. And in the days of these kings, the kings of the fourth empire, which when you follow history, were the Romans. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom, his own kingdom, which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it broke in pieces the iron and the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain and the interpretation is sure. Church, we need to value the uniqueness of God's kingdom. Notice what Daniel says in reference to the kingdom he talks about. He talks about the timing of the kingdom. He says in verse 44, in the, and in the days of these kings. So if you're an Israelite, when can we expect God's kingdom to arrive? You don't expect it during the Babylonian empire. You have to wait till that fourth kingdom comes. They're, they're, they're following that roadmap. There will be four empires during the days of the fourth in, uh, empire kingdom. In the days of the Romans, God's kingdom would come. Remember when John the Immerser started preaching? Remember when Jesus and his apostles started preaching? They talked about the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And people listened because they knew that they were at the end of the road map, that they were in that fourth kingdom, the Roman Empire. Remember how many people John baptized and Jesus' apostles? And this is before, this is preparatory for the church being established in Acts chapter 2. They understood the timing, but they didn't understand that Jesus, the Messiah, would reign over a spiritual kingdom and not a physical kingdom. These Israelites, they, they understood from Daniel, the book of Daniel, that there was going to be a kingdom. But they got the wrong idea about it being physical instead of spiritual. The designer of the kingdom, we learn about that in, as we keep reading verse 44. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom. The kingdom that you and I should want to be a part of is the one that God designed. God built his kingdom, established his kingdom, rules over his kingdom through his son, Jesus Christ. You remember in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, Jesus says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. We'll come back to the end of verse 44 in a few minutes, but let's look at verse 45. Let's look at the design of the kingdom. In the first part of verse 45, the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands. When you read without hands, that means humans didn't have anything to do with it. This was all God. You know, when our country was established, the our founding fathers, they made the constitution of our country. And although it's not perfect, it's an amazing document that's worked well, not perfectly, but worked well for 248 years. <clears throat> but not God's kingdom. 
There wasn't a group of men that got together and decided how things should be done in God's kingdom. God designed it, and he doesn't need uh, our help to build it. We just need to be part of God's kingdom and not try to change the way that he designed it. The duty of the kingdom we see in the latter part of verse 45. And that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, and the clay, the silver, and the gold. The duty of the kingdom of God is to break and to consume all other kingdoms. One of the things that this, this verse probably has various meanings. But one of the things that this, this verse means is that we can go anywhere and we can sow the pure word of the kingdom of God and it will produce a Christian, a citizen of the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter what country you're in, what language you speak, what skin color you are, if you're smart or if you're dumb, if you're educated with a doctorate degree, or if you've got a third grade education. A person can become a citizen of heaven, like we reference in Philippians 3 and verse 20, for our citizenship is in heaven. That might live in another country, but they can become a citizen of heaven. A person can become part of the kingdom of God. In Colossians 1 and verse 13, he, speaking of God, has delivered us from the power of darkness and he's conveyed or transferred us into the kingdom of the son of his love. Not that the Bible doesn't teach us to uh, note that the Bible teaches us to be good citizens of God's kingdom. But it also teaches that our ultimate loyalty should be to God, not to humans, not to governments, etc. Our ultimate loyalty should be to God. And then we get to the words of Acts 5 and verse 29. We must obey God rather than men. We need to ingrain that into the fiber of our being. Because when there's a conflict between what our government, what our leaders, what people tell us to do, and what we have been taught by Almighty God, then we need to be bound and determined that I'm going to do what God wants me to do instead of what men tell me to do. And this is when the rubber meets the road. A lot of Christians, they, they falter there. The sun rises and it's getting hot and they're getting scorched and they throw in the towel and they wither away. We should be determined to do what God tells us to do. Then we read about the dur durability of, the king of God's kingdom. And this is where we go back to um, verse 44. At the end of verse 44. This is not a kingdom that is going to be overthrown. Uh, well, let me just read. Let me just read verse 44. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set a, uh, up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Emphasis on shall never be destroyed. Emphasis on shall stand forever. This is not a kingdom that's going to be overthrown, destroyed, or defeated. This kingdom will last forever. And if you're part of this kingdom, guess what? You will last forever too. If you don't leave it. This is why Jesus taught things like, don't worry about what you're going to eat and what you're going to wear. What did he say in Matthew 6, But seek ye first the kingdom of of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. God's kingdom's going to last forever. Worst case scenario, you die, but you're for living in eternity forever with God. Knowing all this, we should desire the kingdom. Jesus also said in, in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 44, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. What's the treasure that this man 
sells everything that he has to buy the field. What's the treasure? I'm asking. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. The treasure is the kingdom. Are you willing to sell all, give all for the kingdom? To be part of the kingdom? To support the kingdom? Look at the next parable. Matthew 13, 45 and 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking a beautiful pearls who when he had found one pearl of great price, the kingdom of God, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. The pearl of great price, that's the kingdom of God. We ought to long for the kingdom and desire the kingdom above all else because God built it and because where it's in the kingdom of God is where we can have a relationship with God. Only in the kingdom of God can we have a relationship with God. And you say, well, I can have a relationship with God in Christ Jesus. Well, that's right. Because you can't have Christ Jesus without having the kingdom. And you can't have the kingdom without having Christ Jesus. It is the kingdom which is going to last forever. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul teaches about um, the resurrection. And he talks about when Christ returns, that the resurrection of the dead will take place. And what does he say in verse 24? 1 Corinthians 15, 24. Then comes the end. No thousand year reign. When Christ comes, resurrection, the end. When he delivers the kingdom to God, the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power, and you can keep reading, but that suffices right there. When he, when he, when he comes, resurrection will occur. The, uh, then comes the end, and he delivers the kingdom to God, the Father. After Jesus delivers up the kingdom to the, his Father, if you are in the kingdom, you'll live with God forever. One of the big lessons we learned from Daniel chapter 2 is don't be over impressed by what human kingdoms offer. Don't be excessively afraid or threatened by what they threaten. You seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and God promises a bright and blessed future and a relationship with him forever and ever. Oh, how the church, the people of God need to think more about the kingdom of which we are uh, a part of, especially when we're under pressure. What have we learned? What have we learned today? Well, I'll back up a minute before we review what we learned today. Was Daniel in Daniel chapter 2, was he under pressure? Yeah. You don't tell the king that what he dreamed. That's pressure. Remember how he handled it? He took it before God. Did Daniel compromise his trust and obedience to God when under pressure? Learn that throughout all of the book of Daniel. Let's read the end of Daniel chapter 2 before we make our concluding remarks about what we've learned. Daniel chapter 2, verse 46 through 49. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, prostrate before Daniel, and commanded that they should present an offering and incense to him. The king answered Daniel and said, Truly, your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and revealer of secrets, since you could reveal the secret. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts, and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon. And a chief administrator over the wise men of Babylon, also Daniel, uh, petitioned the king and he said, Sh uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. In the end, did God work things out for Daniel? Absolutely. Now he's going to have some other crises and his friends are too as we keep reading but God worked it out you've got Nebuchadnezzar he, he, the only thing he will acknowledge is that Daniel's God knows the future he doesn't mean that he's going to worship him and submit to him in fact 
uh, in a few more chapters, you're going to read how he gets an eye disease. Nebuchadnezzar got an eye disease. Did you know that? Look what I did. Look what I created. Look at all that I've accomplished. And then he's going to be humbled. And then he's going to give God the credit that God deserves. Christians, we learn from Daniel chapter 2 that we need to look up. False ideas are futile. We're surrounded by them. And if we follow the false ideas, they're not going to stand in the day of judgment and we'll be lost. We've got to stand for the truth that God has given us and be loyal. Christians, we need to look up because sincere praise is vital. It's a vital part of our community. It's a vital part of serving and worshiping God. And it creates confidence within us to purge forward, push forward. Human power is transitory. Kingdoms come and kingdom go. Kingdoms go. Governments come, governments go. Don't be overwhelmed by their splendor. It's temporary. And don't be over fearful of their threats. It's temporary. And then what did we learn? God's kingdom is forever. So you can love your country. I didn't say not to. But the priority, the ultimate loyalty that you need to have is to the kingdom of God. And be a citizen, loyal in it, faithful and until the end. And guess what? You're promised eternal life. Revelation 2.10. That's where you need to put all your eggs in. All your eggs in that basket right there. The kingdom of God. That's where your focus needs to be. That's where your priority needs to be. That's where your loyalty needs to be. Church, remember that there will be other kingdoms, but we need to focus on the kingdom of God, the church, and desire the kingdom of God. Desire the church. Well, this concludes Daniel chapter two. Well, I'm not sure if we'll do start chapter three next week or not, but there might be someone here that has not obeyed the gospel plan of salvation. The way that you get into Christ through obedience to the gospel. The Bible talks about that we, we need to have faith in the deity of Christ that we need to repent of our sins, that we need to confess him as Lord of our life, and that we need to be baptized. And bab we're baptized into Christ Jesus, Romans 6 and verse 3, Galatians 3, 27. And that is where we have all spiritual blessings. Ephesians 1 and verse 3. And when we simultaneously are baptized into Christ, Christ adds us to his kingdom. Acts 2 and verse 47. We're part of the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. I get my numbers mixed up. That's why I'm looking. I don't know if it's 13, 12 or 12, 13, but I'll find out here in a second. Yeah, it's 12, 13. For by one spirit, the Holy Spirit, that gives us the, God's word, we were all baptized into one body. And we, we learn in the book of Ephesians that that one body is the church. Whether Jew or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit, we continue to partake of the nourishment that the Holy Spirit provides us through his word. Satan wants you to put it off. Satan wants you to have doubts. But today is the day of salvation. You're not promised tomorrow. Just like kingdoms come and kingdoms go, we just had a funeral yesterday. We come and we go. And it's what we do in the body in this life that we're going to be judged for. There's no second chances. It's appointed to men once to die and then the judgment. This life is all we have. This is the training ground, the proving ground for the future. You got two options, smoking or non-smoking. So if you need to obey the Savior's invitation, will you come as together we stand and sing?